Okay, so we're studying Tanya. We're up to chapter 36. In chapter 35, the Alter Rebbe was explaining the importance of doing the, the, uh, the actual act of the mitzvah. And the reason he brings from Zohar that uh, the, uh, the Shekhinah rests on the head of man, and in order to keep the Shekhinah present, Hashem's presence present upon us, upon us, it's uh, like a candle with uh, a wick and oil. The Shekhinah is the flame, the candle, the uh, the wick is uh, or is the body, and the oil that keeps the flame and the and the wick together is the good deeds, the mitzvahs that we do. And that's how you keep the Shekhinah present on, upon you, is by doing mitzvahs. We had a lengthy explanation why it has to be the mitzvahs, why can't it be just the spirituality or the holiness of the soul, why isn't that enough? And the bottom line is that the reason that the mitzvah is, uh, is the only way, the physical act of a mitzvah, is the only way to keep the Shekhinah present upon, upon us, upon myself, is because the physical act of a mitzvah is the only way to, uh, to literally um, manifest in my life Hashem's essence. My neshama, although it's, uh, it's very, um, it's very uh, um, focused on worshiping Hashem, it's, it's in love with Hashem, it fears Hashem, but it's not completely selfless and transparent to Hashem because it has that love and that fear. So even the holy neshamda, the soul itself, is not a good example of that, of that complete selflessness to Hashem that is required for Hashem to dwell within, because Hashem is, by definition, Hashem is one. So anytime you have anything that conflicts with that oneness, by then, by definition, you don't have Hashem's dwelling, literally. The only way to have a pure expression of Hashem's oneness is for me to do what He wants, to, to, to enact His will so that I'm not expressing myself at all. I'm doing something that's in His interest, not in my interest. When I'm doing that, when I'm doing a mitzvah, the Shekhinah is present upon me. The question, though, is, why is it so important to have myself be illuminated with the presence of Hashem? Why am I so important that I need to have that? It's, uh, we don't yet have a good explanation for why that's necessary. That's nice. And we know that, that you know, it would be wonderful to think that Hashem is dwelling upon me. That's wonderful. But why, why is this the plan? Why, is this, why does this constitute the vast eternal plan? And to answer that, we have chapter 36. So in the Lessons in Tanya book, around page 483 or 484, Lessons in Tanya, volume 2, Vihine. This, <clears throat> this chapter, I should preface, with just a, a heads up that this chapter is really, I mean, the whole Tanya is really fundamental. Uh, it's the foundational work of Chabad philosophy, of Chabad Hasidic philosophy, and Chabad, just parenthetically, the, 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 the body of, of written work, of published written work of Chabad philosophy, the, the sheer volume of it would shock you. It's an extraordinary, it's, it's a, a library full of, uh, you know, we think of you think of Chabad as an outreach movement, and a, you know, which it is, of course. But Chabad, the philosophy of Chabad, is so is so enormous that um, 
it's hard to describe. And of course, it's all based in large part on Tanya. And within Tanya, there are a number of very seminal, pivotal points in Tanya. This, is, this chapter is one of them. The concepts in this chapter, although it's a relatively short chapter, it's a very, very important chapter. It's this whole concept that's constantly repeated over and over and over and over again in Chabad teaching that uh, the idea that Hashem desires a dwelling in the, lower, in the lowest world. That's really, it's, it's really going to come to a head in this chapter. <clears throat> so, chapter 36, Lamidva, the Hine. Modazois, it's well known. Maimarazal, the, uh, the saying of our sages, Shatachlis Briyas Oilam Hazeh, the purpose for this, for the creation of this world. Who it is, Shenis Ava Hakodesh Borahu Lihios Loidira Betachtonim, that Hashem desired to have a dwelling place in the lowest world. Now, that sentence is a little esoteric, but it's got a couple of very critical uh, phrases that need explaining. First of all, why is Ava? Why is it that Hashem desired? And second of all, what is, what is, the, what is the meaning of the, the idea of the lowest world? And also, in between, what is a dira? What is a dwelling? What exactly does, is it that Hashem wants? So Hashem desires, gotta pay attention to that word, a dwelling, gotta pay attention to that, in the lowest world, gotta pay attention to that. We'll see how, we'll see how we do. So Vihine, Loishayach lefon of Yisborah Maila Umata. You can't, it's hard to imagine that Hashem is, uh, is, is impressed with the the level of worlds, because in Hashem's, from Hashem's perspective, there is no upper and lower. So, in Hashem's view, there is no higher and lower. Because God fills all worlds equally. God, God is everywhere, and everything is filled with Him, and it can't be about Him. But the meaning is, when you say the, high, the lower, lowest world, what you mean is, I'm sorry, what does it mean that Hashem is completely beyond higher and lower? It's before he created the world, he was absolutely one and he was the only, there was nothing besides him. He even filled this space that he created in which to create the world. He fills that space too. And now that the world is created and does exist, the same, the same holds true. Hashem is still everywhere. And there's no such thing as, as a place where he isn't. So what then does it mean that he's, look, he's looking for a dwelling as if he isn't somewhere? And what does it mean the lowest world? Rak, shehashinuihu el hamekablum chayusev oriyaz barich. The difference, the change in, in, in reality, pre-creation versus post-creation is only from the perspective of the created being. The world that exists now feels distant from him. So from the perspective of creation, there is higher and lower. But from Hashem's perspective, there's no such thing. The world, the creation, feels the difference in level. Because the worlds, the various worlds that Hashem created and all the different levels that Hashem created, they all receive the, uh, the um, uh, creative energy from Hashem through various levels of covering or, or garments or veils or curtains, depending on how you, uh, or filters, depending on how you understand that. The word the Altadebi uses is garments. So all of the different levels 
in creation, all the different things and, and levels or worlds that Hashem created all receive that divine creative energy through many layers, many garments, which cover and conceal Hashem's light. As it says, no man can see me and live. And uh, the, the, uh, the sages say that that doesn't mean that a human being can't see God and live, and that's the extent of the meaning of the verse. It means more than that. It also means, like the sages explain, the, the different uh, levels of angels have different names and different titles. But they're all, uh, for the most part, they're all referred to as different types of animals. Um, living creatures. They're creatures. So when it says, Ki lo yira'ani ha'odam v'chai, lo yira'ani ha'odam, man cannot see me, v'chai, the simple meaning is, and live, but another, another way of translating that, an alternative translation is, Ki lo yira'ani ha'odam, a person cannot see me, v'chai, and also those creatures cannot see me. Also the chai cannot see me. Meaning even the angels can't see God. The, the, the simplest explanation of that is anything that could see God would completely uh, dissipate into the awesomeness of Hashem. I mean, how, could anything, how could anything created exist in the presence of the essence of Hashem? So if you saw Hashem himself, you would like, for example, the story in, the, in Tanakh where uh, Shimshon's parents see an angel. They think they just saw God and they think they're going to die because you can't survive an, a, a, an experience like this. And they knew that they didn't see the essence of God. They thought you know, it was, an, it was a, a revelation of God, an angelic revelation. And nevertheless, they thought they were going to die. And they're right, except for the fact that it was an angel and, and they weren't meant to die. But if you were to see God himself, even an angel, if, if an angel were to see God, you couldn't live. It couldn't, uh, couldn't survive the overwhelming revelation. It would completely... Uh... So all of the worlds, all the levels of creation, even the spiritual higher worlds, also receive their revelation of godliness through various levels of concealment and covering through many garments or veils or filters. This is the whole idea of this concept in Kabbalah called Hishtalshalut. Hishtalshalus is from the word Shalshelet. Shalshelet means a chain. Hishtalshalus means the chain effect of the creation of all of the worlds. Just like one ring in a chain uh, paves, paves the way for the next ring in the chain. So one ring leads to another. The same is with the worlds that God created. Each, each step down is facilitated by the step before it and facilitates the step after it. So the more distant a world is from Hashem himself, that means the more concealment there is. So you have one layer of concealment, then you get the highest world. Then you get the next layer of concealment, then you get the second highest world. You have another layer of concealment, and you have etc. Until you get to where there is so much concealment that you have the lowest possible world. So the union of Hishtalshulas Oilamas, this chain, uh, chain reaction of, of creation of worlds from level to level, through all of the, uh, the many uh, garments that cover up and hide the, the light and uh, energy of Hashem himself. Ad until the point, culminating with, to the point where this world, this physical, material world, is created at the end of the chain. But it's not part of the chain. It's what it's what dangles at the end of the chain. It's not this world is not part of the chain itself because it doesn't it doesn't uh, 
It doesn't have the same characteristics as the rungs of the chain. Most notably, the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't lead to another world. There's nothing lower than this. But also, he'll explain that it's different from all of the, of the spiritual higher realms in, an, in, a, in a couple of, of critical ways. It's the lowest level. Uh, in levels, in degrees, this is the lowest. There is nothing lower than this. With regards to the concealment of his light, and this incredibly intense, doubled and redoubled darkness. Add to the point where Shehu Mole Klipois, it's this world is full of Klipa, which is that which is un or non godly, the Sitra Achra and the other side, the unholy, Shehim Neged Hashem Mamash, they, the unholiness, Klipa, is literally anti God. Loimar, they say, the klipa says, Ani ve'afsi oid, I am. And aside from me, there is nothing. Which is the antithesis of godliness. So not only is this lowest world the lowest in level, in degree of concealment, but there are two important distinctions. The first is that in this world, there is no revelation of godliness, no natural revelation of godliness. The only revelation of godliness is when we reveal godliness, but the world itself completely conceals godliness. Whereas the other worlds, all the spiritual realms until you get to this world, if you were to visit one of those other worlds, you would find that there is a natural revelation of godliness in those worlds only at different levels of concealment. It's when you get to this world that there is no revelation of godliness, no natural revelation. And when there is a revelation, it's called a miracle or it's a mitzvah or something like that. That's one major distinction. The second important distinction is that not only is this world naturally not revealing or not uh, doesn't have godliness on display, it actually has the opposite. It has the contrary. It has klipa, which means this world allows for the actual denial of God's existence, where the created being itself can deny the existence of its own creator. That's an extraordinary departure from the essence of godliness. But in Hasidus, it's explained that, that it, it, because of those distinctions, it's not considered part of the chain of worlds. It's what comes after the chain of worlds. So you have all these spiritual worlds, world after world, ring after ring in the chain, and then all the way at the end of the chain, because you have that whole chain that leads all the way down to the bottom, the next step is a step into absolutely ungodliness, absolute ungodliness, non-godliness. And when you have absolute non-godliness, that allows for ungodly, which means the denial of God's existence. And that's the world in which we live. That's the world in which we are created. And that's why it's called the lowest world. Because any lower than this can't exist. Any lower than this means not only is there no revelation of God, but there actually isn't any godliness. If there isn't any godliness, then there's no existence because existence comes from God. So the farthest away you can go from godliness and still exist is to where there is godliness present, but it's completely concealed. That's where we are. Any further than any farther than that would mean there actually isn't godliness, and then you can't exist. There's no creative energy. So this is this is like. This world that the, that the Medrash refers to as the Tachtoinim, the lowest possible world, means that world that is the, the precipice between existence and non-existence. And because it's right at the edge of non-existence, it's where godliness is absolutely concealed, and you can even have the denial of God's existence. That's where we are. A world in which the klipa, the unholiness, can say, 
I am and there's nothing besides me. There is no God. So this is where we exist. Vihine, bottom of page 487. God desires to have a dwelling in this lowest world. So Vihine, Tachlis Hayishtalshalus, Tachlis Hishtalshalus Ha'olamais, the ultimate purpose of this chain descent of world after world, Viridosa Mi Madrega La Madrega, and their descent from level to level more and more concealment and moving away, quote unquote, from godliness. The, the ultimate purpose can't be in the higher world. Because for them, it's just a departure from godliness. That's all it is. And there's, there's nothing to be gained in the spirit with the highest world. What is the highest world? The highest world is a place, so to speak, a spiritual place where there is a concealment of godliness and therefore it exists. The world after that is a spiritual place in which there's a greater concealment of godliness and therefore it can exist. But there's no, there's no tachlis there. There's no purpose. What's the value of being more distant from God? You're still in a situation where there is a, a divine revelation and yet it's just less than there was before. So what did you accomplish? The ultimate purpose is going to be in this lowest world. All of, the, all of the spiritual worlds are all various degrees of divine revelation. Revelation, not just creation, not just creative energy, but actual revelation. Even the lowest of the spiritual worlds, there's a very, you know, very well, well veiled, but nevertheless present revelation. Like I said, this world there is no revelation. This is a whole new kind of a whole new kind of creature, a whole new kind of of by the way, he actually alludes to this. If you look back a couple of lines, towards the bottom of page 486, he says, uh, the, the chain reaction of the world, or the chain development of the world, the histalshalus of the world, of the worlds from level to level, through many garments, world after world, through many garments that conceal the, the light of Hashem and the energy of Hashem until this world is created. He doesn't say that about the other worlds. He doesn't refer to them as being created. He refers to them as being the result of the concealment on top of the concealment of the previous world. So you have one concealment, you have spiritual world number one. You have two concealments, you have spiritual world number two. Three concealments, spiritual world number Then this world is created. What he means by that is that it's, it's a whole new kind of creation. It's not like anything that came before it. All of the worlds that came before it are various degrees of diminished revelation of God. This world is not a diminished revelation of God. This world is a creation that can come into being when God's revelation is completely concealed. There is no revelation. So, so this world is really not, it's not just another level of concealment. This world, the physical world, is what it is because there is no revelation, not like all the other worlds that have various degrees of divine revelation. Here there is no revelation, there's divine energy, but it is completely concealed. And this has to be where the tachlis is. In other words, tachlis. Tachlis is a great word. This world has to be where the tachlis is. Tachlis has got to be here because it's a new thing. It's a new. It's a new. Uh, a new creation. All of the worlds that come before it are just various degrees of revelation or or concealed revelation. So the tachlis is going to be here. Shekach ola beretzayna yisbarich, for this arose in the desire of Hashem in Hashem's will. Lihiyos nachas ruach lefon of yisbarich 
that he should get this pleasure, there should be this pleasure before him, kadiskafias itra achra, when the klipa is, uh, is, is subjugated, and when darkness is converted into light. This is a desire that he has. He desires to have this pleasure where there is darkness and it is subjugated and it is converted into light. This is what he wants. This is his desire. That Hashem's light should illuminate the darkness in this place of darkness and unholiness, which is this entire world. Beyeser says with with the greater strength, beyeser ois and more uh, more intensity, perhaps more enthusiasm. The Yisrael or min and the benefit, like King Solomon says, the uh, the increased light that comes from darkness more so than the light that shines, than God's light that shines in the higher worlds. The light that can shine in this world, coming from the darkness, is greater than the light of Hashem that can shine in the higher worlds where there is concealment. Because in those worlds, the spiritual worlds, whatever light there is, whatever revelation there is, is through concealment, the hiding of God's face. That cover and conceal the light of Hashem. Because otherwise they would cease to exist. They would be, they would be nullified into non-existence. It's only in this world where you don't have natural revelation, when revelation does happen and it comes out of darkness, it can, it can be the revelation of God himself, not through concealment, and yet the world continues to exist, as he will explain. Overwhelmed yet? <laughs> Couple of points. First of all, he seems to be explaining rationally He's giving you a logical explanation for why it has to be this way. Why Hashem chose for, for his, his ultimate uh, plan to be fulfilled in this world. He's giving you a, a very logical explanation. And in the middle of this logical explanation, he says, that's what God wanted. This is what arose before his will to have, he desired to have the pleasure of the light that comes out of darkness. Why did he switch from a rational, logical explanation into a, this is what God wants, what do you want? What are you going to do? He wants it. Not only that, but Hasidus makes a huge deal out of this. There's the classic saying that in Yiddish, if a taiva frekmenish kan kashis. You can't ask questions about a desire. You can't question a desire. God wants it. You want to ask why God wants? There is no explanation for a desire. You can't ask why a desire. A desire means this is, this is part of who I am. This is, what, this is what would please me. I can't explain to you why it would please me. This is me. Like, like why does a living thing want to continue living? No, oh, why? Because that's the definition of being a living thing. A living thing wants to live. So why does Hashem want a dwelling in the lowest world? You can't ask that question. Not because it's not a fair question, or not because we don't have an answer, but because it's not, a, it's not, a, 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 it's not an appropriate question. You're asking a question about something that does not need an explanation. A desire doesn't need to be explained. It's part of the definition of the one desire. So when, when the Medrash qualifies this pleasure that Hashem gets from having light come out of darkness as being his desire, that basically removes it from logical or rational conversation. What you're saying is this is going to be beyond rational explanation. Well, then why are we going through this exercise of rationally explaining why this is supposed to be this way if you're just going to say this is what he wants? 
so the Alter Rebbe is giving us two, two sides of the same coin here. The Alter Rebbe is saying there is a very rational explanation for why you need to do the act of the mitzvah and why the mitzvah, the physical act of the mitzvah is going to be the ultimate uh, fulfillment of, of, the, of the vast eternal plan and, and, and uh, the purpose for creation. And then he says that with all of that, with all of the explanation that you're going to, to offer, there's still going to be parts of it you're not going to be able to explain other than to say, this is what he wanted. For example, We say that uh, when you have light that comes out of darkness, the light is much greater than natural light on its own. You have light coming out of darkness that's a greater light. And, and that's supposed to be a reason for why Hashem wants to have mitzvahs performed in this world? Hashem created that nature. The fact the very fact that dark, that light that comes out of darkness is greater than light naturally, that fact is also part of Hashem's creation. So you're saying that the reason Hashem wants this is because he created it this way and therefore he needs it this way? This is a, this is a circular argument. And even if you were to say that that's what Hashem wants, Hashem, okay, Hashem created darkness, and Hashem created light, and Hashem created the nature of light to be such that light that comes out of darkness is greater than, than natural light. But light and dark is only relevant to the lowest world, to the created being. But God isn't imp impacted by light and darkness. He created them. He's not impacted by them. So why would, why would the difference between light versus dark or light that comes out of darkness versus light, that, why does that have any, any relevance to God? God is, high, is, a, is beyond that because he created that. For that, the Alter Rebbe includes this quote here, this, this expression that this is his desire. Why, why did Hashem create the, the world or creation in such a way that the light that comes from darkness is a greater light? The answer is because that's essentially how he needs it to be. This is what he wants. This is his desire. And without this, he can't get what he needs. Why does he want it? Huh? You, that's, not, that's not a good question. So Hashem wants what he wants. Why does he want what he wants? For the same reason, any any anything wants what it wants. This is part of what he is. This is part of him. This is if there's such thing as a definition of Hashem. This is part of a definition, if you if you can use that that expression. So you can't ask why he wants, but we know from the Medrash that what he does want is a dwelling in the lowest world, because that's where the light is greater, because it's coming out of darkness. Were he to have only the light that already exists naturally in the spiritual worlds, that wouldn't be as, imp as impressive to him or wouldn't be as much a source of pleasure to him than the light that comes out of darkness. The light that, that can be created in a place where his light doesn't shine naturally. This world where there is no natural divine light, where his light is completely concealed, which means this is a dark world spiritually. If in this world we can reveal his light, that light will be far greater than light as it is without coming out of darkness. So it's as if we're saying that God's light is actually increased by us doing mitzvahs in a world of darkness. Because without the darkness, you wouldn't have the benefit of the increased light coming from darkness. To what extent do we reveal God's light? 
To what extent is God, is God uh, wanting? To what extent does God want his light revealed in this world? For that, you have the, ex the, the, the term, the expression, dira betachtoinim, a dwelling in the lowest world. What's a dwelling? So Hasidus uses the analogy of a human king because very often in the Medrash and in, in, in other places, and in, of course in Hasidus as well, the analogy of the king is always used to, to, to describe, to try to understand Hashem. So imagine a king who has a nation. The king has his subjects. The king has his provinces. The king has his agents, his ministers, his armies, his generals, his, his advisors, his closest advisors. All of those various levels of closeness or distance from the king, the way the king presents himself to those various levels are all through some kind of... Uh, like Hasidus refers to the garments. He's always dressed up in some presentation, right? The king presents himself in, in some uh, outfit or some getup so that he can represent, so that, so that he presents himself to whatever particular segment of the population in a way that's appropriate to that segment. So to the general population, he, you know, he puts on his whole, you know, the whole fanfare and all of the uh, the the, the uh, royal garments and the, the whole getup, and he's among his ministers, his you know his closer inner circle. He's uh, he's less there's less pretense, and the closer you are to the king, the less pretense there is. Right, the farther you are from the king, the more pretense, the more pomp and circumstance, and the more show the more uh, royal garments, the more presentation. So the same is with all of the various spiritual worlds. All of the various spiritual worlds represent all those levels of garments which, which bring the king to the various levels in the presentation that's appropriate to that level. But what about the king and his queen? There, there's no pretense. There's no show. There's no garments that, that present the king in a particular way. With the queen, the king is himself. He's completely at home. That's what the Medrash is referring to when it says God desires a dwelling. A king has a palace. See, it should have said God desired a palace in the lowest world. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say God desired a palace in the lowest world. It says God desired a dwelling in the lowest world because palaces he had. He's got plenty of palaces. He wants a dwelling. Dwelling means where he can be himself without any pretense, without any without any uh, concealment or any presentation. God wants to be completely at home, completely comfortable, without any need for any kind of pretense, specifically in this lowest world, because that's where that's possible. Anywhere else, wherever there is some... Uh, uh, revelation of God's light. Those are like the palaces, right? Those are like the various levels of ministers or generals or, or subjects or people. There, God, it's not God himself that you're getting. You're getting the king. But God isn't just a king. God is more than a king. God is God. He became a king when he chose to, to make a people, to make a nation, right? God wants to be himself. The only way he could do that is by creating a situation, a world, 
in which there is no natural revelation of God's light and have God be revealed in that world himself, not some revelation, not a shine or a ray of his light. That's the, that's the various pre, you know, kingly royal robes or the crown or the, or the chariot or whatever it is. He doesn't want that. That he has in all the spiritual worlds. What he gets here is the revelation of his essence, like, like we learned in chapter 35, that the performance of the mitzvah is a revelation of his essence, not of his light, not of his you know, revelation of his, of his energy, but he himself. You have his will being revealed. That's called the creation of a dwelling for Hashem in the lowest world. A dwelling is, is a place where he can be himself. A lowest world is a place where he isn't naturally, there's no revealed light of God here. And it's specifically in this realm where there is no natural revelation of the divine light where we can reveal his essence and he can be comfortable in that situation. That's called dira betachtoinim. That's called a dwelling in the lowest world. And that's why it has to happen through mitzvahs, as, as mentioned in chapter 35, right? So continuing a few more lines here. That's why Hashem gave us the Torah. Which is called strength and, and might. It's through the Torah that we have the ability to reveal Hashem. That God, the Talmud, the Talmud says that God gives the, the, the tzaddikim who are going to uh, who are going to receive the revelation of God in the world to come. He has to give them special strength to be able to do that, to re to receive their reward. The righteous are going to have to be given an extra an extra boost of strength in order to receive godliness. So that they shouldn't be completely nullified into non-existence because they're receiving godliness without any kind of uh, protective uh, veils. Like it says that in, in, uh, the, in the world to come, Hashem, your teacher, Hashem will no longer uh, be concealed. Meaning, he won't cover himself with some kind of a cloak. Your eyes will see your teacher. All these different verses that tell us that we're going to literally see Hashem. The sun will no longer be the source of light for you, your daylight. Hashem will be the light for you. And it's known that the days of Mashiach, it's known that the days of Mashiach, and especially the latter part of the days of Mashiach, when, uh, when you have the resurrection of the dead, that's the ultimate purpose for which the world was created, so that, the, so that you can have the, the absolute revelation of God in this physical world. And that's why it has to, you have to have the tchias amesim, the, the resurrection of the dead, because it doesn't mean going into heaven and the, and, the, and the ultimate purpose for creation is when we all go back to heaven. That's not ultimate purpose. Ultimate purpose is here in this world. When everybody who, who, who participated in the process of making this world holy is here, here in this physical world. Hashem wants it here. And for that, you have to have the Torah, which gives us the mitzvahs and gives us the ability to, to bring about that revelation and to be able to withstand it, the strength to be able to receive it. And in the footnote, the Kabbalah schar, Iker Be'elaf Ashri'i, Kamesha Kosov, Likote Tere, Me'ari, Zechariah Lebracha, you could ask, uh, what about our reward? This is all what Hashem gets out of it. What do we get out of it? I thought that the world to come is when we get our reward. The answer is, yeah, we do get our reward, but that's in the first in the first uh, stage of Mashiach's coming, known as the Elif Ashvi, the seventh millennium, 
But then the world to come, the ultimate world to come is when you have Tchias HaMesim, or the resurrection of the dead, and then you have Hashem's revelation here in this world, which is really the ultimate purpose, more so than my reward for doing the mitzvah. The ultimate purpose, the ultimate reward is when the mitzvah and its, uh, its uh, effect come to fruition, which is the revelation of Hashem in this world, and that would be a complete revelation without any kind of concealment, where Hashem can be himself, like, like in a dwelling. That's ultimately the purpose of creation, and that's ultimately the purpose of the neshama, the godly soul that comes down into a physical body and is enclosed in a, in, in a, in a physical body and an animal instinct, an animal soul, in order to do mitzvahs in this world, because this is where Hashem desires to have his his essence be revealed, not his shine, not his light. Hashem wants to have his essence revealed in a condition that isn't dependent on some revelation or some shine of his light. It's he himself. That's, that's brought about by our mitzvahs in this, our physical mitzvahs physical performance of mitzvahs in this physical world.